Welcome to a very special edition of the Vic State Cricket Podcast because Will Pukowski is our subject today. He's our interview today, but it was actually an interview that was done two or three weeks ago, uh, literally days before, unfortunately, he got hit in the head in the second 11 game against South Australia. So we didn't think it was appropriate at the time to play the interview um, to make sure that everything was okay with Will. And the good news is that now everything is okay with Will and he'll play against New South Wales later this week. So to explain exactly where Will's at, um, I thought we'd just get in Dave Hussey before we actually play the interview with Will from a couple of weeks ago. Huss, thanks for coming in. Pleasure. Um, it was obviously a very cautious approach because of Will's history, which is totally fair enough. And we want Will playing Krieger Victoria for the next 10 years. So I can understand the sort of the cautiousness around what happened after that South Australian game. Um, the good news is he's okay and he's going to be playing this week against New South Wales. Yeah, the good news is he's past medically fit to play. He's back in the squad, which is excellent. Um, he's firing. He batted them in the nets yesterday. He's uh, fit and ready to go. So after the very cautious approach we took. When we hear the interview with Will, it is it is incredible with some of the things that he speaks about that he's never really spoken publicly about before. It was very brave of, of what he did. As much as you're being, I guess, sensitive and being cautious with Will, in a lot of ways, Will doesn't want that anymore. He wants to get out there and do it. He wants to be just treated like everybody else. So it's a, it's a fine line in a lot of ways with Will at the moment. Yeah, but the number one priority is his health and we take our medical team's uh, advice um, to the letter. They're excellent. They've got his best uh, interest at heart and we'll be very, very cautious, um, with, especially with Will's history. But the uh, the ultimate goal is for Will to play uh, Shield cricket and hopefully test cricket for Australia in, in the longer term. Well, I actually ask him about that, whether he still wants to play cricket for Australia and how much he wants to play for Victoria. Um, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate just clarifying that, the fact that he's okay and ready to go. So sit back and and enjoy. Uh, it's nearly an hour with Will Pukowski, learning a little bit more about Will as a person as much as a cricketer. He loves wearing the navy blue of Victoria. He uses his feet and goes again through mid-wicket. That's an even better shot from the Victorian captain. Swept away very nicely by the Cole Bottom for four. Oh, he's been given! That is 50. The man from Northcote. And welcome to another edition of the Vic State Cricket Podcast, the first of 2024. And we've got a very special guest, uh, someone that I think we've all wanted to hear from for quite a while, and it is Will Pukowski. Will, welcome. Thanks, Whitey. Thanks for having me. Now, you've had a very interesting period since your Sheffield Shield, your last Sheffield Shield game. You've gone and got yourself engaged. Yes, I have, yeah. So got got the job done, which was good. It was pretty nerve-wracking, but, uh, yeah, a few months planning sort of, Went into it and, yeah, managed to get it done. There were a few hiccups along the way, but... Hiccups? Yeah, well, the so M's brother proposed two days before, which ah, I had right. no idea about, and then rattled the bejesus out of me because <laughs> I was like, is there a certain amount of time you have yes. to wait or, like, what's the sort of, you know, what's the appropriate thing to do? But I was like, nah, bugger them. I've planned this for too long. <laughs> I need to get it done. <laughs> what was uh, more nerve-wracking... Opening the batting for Australia or asking your future father-in-law if it's okay? Father-in-law by an absolute street. No <laughs> questions whatsoever. And then what about the actual execution of the plan? Yeah, it was uh, it was good. We'd, I'd sort of tried to rig it because I, I wanted it to be a complete surprise. But there was this one spot that I know Em absolutely loves. And I was like, I need to get her there but make her think it's her idea that we're going there. So just pose kind of leading questions throughout the day just to sort of say, all right, let's get to this spot. And it was about a 45-minute walk away. Right. For the first 44 minutes, I was like pretty chilled and pretty excited. Got to sort of go time and absolutely <laughs> lost it and had no – I just turned into a shadow of myself and just, <laughs> yeah, I think I had this big speech planned. None of it came out. Just sort of got down and – managed to ask somehow and, yeah, got the yes, which was good. Now, did you choose the ring or is this something that's chosen at a later date? No, so I got to uh, use her very good friend Belle as uh, support because Em had sort of worded me up that she was sort of the person to go to. So I got the placement ring. She'd sort of recommended one because I was like, look, if you're going to wear this for the rest of your life, I want you to pick it and, and enjoy it. So we're, we're actually in the process at the moment of, picking out a ring. So I'm trying to get the zeros down on the ring as much as I can, but we'll see how that goes. Very good. And also since your last Sheffield Shield game, we've seen you a fair bit on the TV doing the commentary. I know it's not the first year you've done it. How much do you enjoy that side of the game? Yeah, I have enjoyed it. It's um, 
it's been quite uh, – I think the more you do it, probably like playing, you get less and less nervous and you sort of just free up a bit and enjoy yourself. Um, and you sort of probably develop relationships with other commentators, which makes it a bit easier in a weird way. It was probably one of those things which – when you're sort of growing up, you never really put that much thought into it, but you'd probably have an appreciation for it where you sort of end up bouncing off people quite quite well. And I think almost the same as my cricket, you sort of used to get quite down on yourself if you made mistakes, but now I sort of got to a stage where I'm not as fast and just sort of get on with it and try and be myself as much as I can. I know it's a different form of the game to say first-class cricket, but have you learnt things about the game from being on the other other side that you perhaps didn't think about? Yeah, definitely. It's a much easier game from the commentary box than it is out in the middle, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things where I think hopefully as sort of a modern player, you can give some kind of insight to, to the general viewer as to how difficult it is what these people do. I think we're all probably fall victim to thinking that sport's a lot easier than it is mm. um, when you're sort of watching. I'm definitely a victim watching my footy team or my soccer team play. <laughs> thinking like, how have you missed that or messed that up? But, yeah, when you're out in the middle, it's not as easy. So, um, yeah, it's definitely – and I I also really enjoy sort of that tactical side of the game. And um, I think 2020 is probably the ultimate mm. in that in terms of cricket because it's so fast-paced that you don't have much time and your mistakes are well and truly sort of amplified, um, probably more so than in the longer form where you maybe have a bit more time to rectify it or – or switch plans, but if you get one thing wrong, it can be the difference between winning and losing. Do you think you'll go back and play it at some point, or is, are you sort of seeing more uh, the longer form of the game suits your skill set? I think the longer form definitely suits me more. It's not something I've completely ruled out, but it's not something I'm desperate to do. I think just with my journey so far, I think the more I focus on sort of the longer form, I'd definitely like to get back and play 50 over cricket, because uh, I think my skill set can sort of be honed to that form of the game a bit better. But, yeah, the 2020 stuff, it's definitely not something that I've ruled out, but it's probably one of those things where long-term I'll see how things keep going. Um, but for now, I'm really enjoying that longer form and, and really enjoying sort of getting myself immersed in that and getting back into the rhythm of that, which has been really good. The fact you're saying you're enjoying playing cricket, even if it is the longer form, is really encouraging, I think, for all Victorian cricket fans. Did you think that that would be the case even six months ago, that you'd be talking that way about all the things that are ahead of you as opposed to things that are behind you? Uh, definitely not, to be honest. Um, yeah, I guess what I've been through is quite unique and quite personal and uh, very frustrating at times as well, uh, very educational. I've learned a lot about myself and the world, I think, over the last sort of five or six years. Um and it's been one of those things where I've probably never felt like I was ever going to get a clear run at it because I knew I had this thing sort of lingering over me, which I've thrown the kitchen sink at, to be honest, with a, with a variety of different sort of treatment plans and methods because, yeah, I guess that desire and um, want to be a professional cricketer and play at the highest level has never gone away, but I've just had these challenges that have been pretty big roadblocks that have been stopping me from doing that. But I feel like after sort of years of searching, I've found a solution to that to a, to a very strong degree, if I'm honest. Um, and I've never felt more confident in myself that I can get through games back to back. And um, yeah, that sort of four games in a row before Christmas was huge for me because it was something that like, I know this might sound ridiculous to people because I'm doing something that I love and like I hate that I sort of say this because uh, – it is something that I love and I'm very grateful that I get to be a professional cricketer. But getting through those four games was the biggest confidence booster I could have probably ever got. And yeah, it has just given me belief that the mechanisms I've got in place now to deal with what I've been dealing with are really working. And it sort of makes all that hard work you put in behind the scenes worth it. Um, I try and liken it as much as I can to like if someone had a chronic back issue and, you know, every time they played games, their back flared up and they couldn't find a solution. And yeah, I feel like I've, I've finally found that solution and um, I'm hoping that that – I'm not expecting that it's going to be a clean run and it's all going to be sort of sunshine and rainbows from here. But, yeah, the, the positivity I've generated from that is just absolutely huge and the confidence I've generated. So, yeah, I feel like finally I'm, what, 25 now. I feel like I've been around for a while for a 25-year-old. But um, just feeling like I can look at the next sort of 10, 12 years and go, okay, I can genuinely see myself – 
being able to do this and get through has just been massive. So, yeah, it's been a really exciting few months. And this might sound silly, but the fact that you're able to put those back-to-back games together without scoring big hundreds that you've done for Victoria, yeah, does that even give you more confidence that I'm not necessarily loving at loving the cricket at the moment yeah. from the point of view there there have been 30s, there have been failures, yeah. there have been some odd dismissals, yeah. there have been some tough batting conditions yeah. that you can still reflect back and go, I'm enjoying cricket. Yeah, I think so. And it's sort of probably part of the whole picture is that you're just so happy that you're playing that you're – um, yeah, my, I guess, lack of performance hasn't probably affected – not that it ever did. Like that's never been the problem. Like batting's never really been – too much of an issue to be honest but I think it's even been a learning curve in that regard where um, I've never really played consistently enough to go through a patch where I'm not actually going that well if that makes sense like I've sort of never when I've played I've done pretty well most of the time and then I haven't played consistently enough to really go through those patches where you go I'm like where's my next run coming from Um, and I'm sort of probably a bit of a perfectionist and I've been trying to find the answers, but trying to be sort of kind to myself and go, okay, it's been a fair bit of time out of the game. It's not just going to click for you overnight. Like you do need to go through these phases where things aren't going as well. And you're just looking for that sort of feel and that, that sort of form to go, okay, yeah, I'm back playing my, my natural game. So that's been a challenge in itself, but to be honest, I'm so grateful that that's the challenge I'm going through and not Mm. the other stuff I've been going through. So yeah, it's quite bizarre that that's sort of where you're at. But it's just, yeah, it's been a rogue few years. But you mm-hmm. sort of feel like, okay, well, if I'm on top of the other stuff, it's actually exciting that I get to just focus on my batting for a while and try and work through that like a normal cricketer rather than have all this other stuff going on. And then, yeah, from a batting perspective, I'm finding it like enjoyably frustrating if that yeah. that might sound bizarre, but like not quite feeling like you're batting as well as you could be has actually been exciting because it's like, okay, sweet, I can really work on this and – um, yeah, I'm all, I've always been someone who loves training and loves sort of finding those little things that um, sort of kick you back into your groove. And I'm probably lucky in that regard where it's just – it's never been really a chore for me. I've just always had fun with it. So, yeah, going through one of those phases at the moment but sort of feel like I've, you know, tinkered with a few things and feel like I'm starting to get back into that groove slowly, which is good. It's a sort of almost a, an upside-down way of looking at cricket in a way yeah. because most people that, that will be listening to this or watching this love cricket and probably play cricket and they have sleepless nights when they can't score a run yeah. um, and they worry whether we give the game away, it's getting too hard and all these sorts of things which are very normal um, emotions to have whereas for you it's been very different. Runs have never been the problem yeah. and I think most people think, oh, gee, if I can score as many runs as will, I'd play forever. Yeah. So it can be a bit of a, a confusing thing from the outside looking in to see what you've gone through. Yeah, I completely understand that. And, yeah, I think one day I'll be sort of ready to sort of tell my whole story and it'll probably make a lot more sense to a lot more people. But, yeah, it's one of those things where you probably realise, like, and it's something that I've learnt and where I'm probably eternally grateful, to be honest, because... I think if you get put into a cricket bubble and things are a bit easy your whole life where, you know, you go through the pathway and you always get picked and you, you know, do well and then you're playing for Victoria and you're playing for Australia, like you probably, well, I don't know, but I don't think I would have had the same perspective and understanding as I do now. And, um, yeah, the one thing that I've probably learned about it all is you have no idea what people are going through because, yeah, I've sort of explained what I've been through to my inner circle of people and, most of actually all of the answers I've got have been like, Jesus, I would have never guessed that in a million years. Like that doesn't even make sense to me. And I go, yeah, well, it hasn't made sense to me for years either, but I've been sort of on this, um, yeah, pathway to trying to understand it all. And, um, yeah, sort of get a bit more of an understanding of myself and how to operate and how to go about things. So yeah, it is weird, but it's like, it's actually been really nice being a normal (laughs) cricketer for a while and actually stressing out about, oh, gee, I need to find some runs somewhere. And, um, you know, why isn't my on-drive feeling as nice as it usually is sort of thing? But, yeah, as I said, it's it's weird. I think, yeah, you just never know what other people are going through. So it's probably a good lesson that if you if you feel like someone's letting you down or not doing what you think they are, maybe, you know, check in on them first and see if they're sort of struggling with something else because, yeah, it can often be some weird things that people go through that, like, I didn't feel comfortable even speaking to psychologists about what I've been through for sort of five or six years. Um, 
And yeah, it's just one of those things where you're like, gee, I can only imagine the stuff that people go through. Like I'm very lucky. I still function at a very high level and um, yeah, I, it's nothing compared to what, what others have to suffer through. So when I watch you, Bat, there's this sereneness about you, this calmness about you, again, from on the other side of the fence. But when you're out there, is that still the case with all the challenges that you've gone on that it's whether it's your happy place or whether you're going to some sort of um, autopilot? Explain what it's like for you in, and your mind when you're out there playing. Yeah, it. to be honest, it has been my happy place in a way. Um and it's actually been weird because I feel like I've been trying to learn, like even this season, learn to bat with almost a different brain because it used to be just like, well, thank God I'm just out here batting. Like I can just sort of get into my zone. and you're Almost you're escaping? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. And you sort of still, you still get performance anxiety. You're still worried about those things. But it was always sort of just, okay, while well, I'm out here, I'm, I can just sort of go through my process and my process will, will hopefully be good enough over a over a long period of time. But I think, yeah, probably this year coming back, I've learnt that that's not just going to work automatically all the time. And um, even if you think you've got your process knuckled down, you might be sort of a little bit out of sync and there's little habits you develop. Like even I had the shoulder surgery, which has sort of been forgotten in all of this and little things with how your mechanics change when you have a shoulder operation and you're batting for a bit, trying to nurse your shoulder um and like even looking at footage and going like gee that's changed like I'm quite uh I guess obsessive with that kind of stuff like going like okay something's not quite syncing up right Mm -hmm. and like I have a very clear picture of what my best game is and if I'm not feeling like that I guess I find it really hard to like be okay like I want to just sort of find that and when I've found that I can sort of relax in a way yeah um but yeah, it's almost like relearning now that I'm sort of sort of feel like I've found a solution to a lot of the issues I've had, relearning to bat again with like, I guess that extra performance anxiety because you're so keen to do well. Like I've almost felt like I've been too keen to do well in the first half of the year in a way where you're so desperate to make runs that you're yeah. sort of losing a bit of that calmness. And um, as someone, one of my, uh, an ex-coach actually here who I'm still in very close contact with and who... I, I love to bits, Lockie Stevens. He said to me, like, you've always been a surgeon rather than, what, what was he comparing it to? Surgeon rather than a tradesman. And I was like, mate, I feel like the biggest tradesman ever at the moment. Like, I feel like it's all a grind. And he's just like, he's very good because he just gave me the old mate, like, you've been out of the game for a while, it will click. You've just got to be patient with yourself and just sort of stick to your guns because you'll you'll find that again. It doesn't go anywhere, but... Yeah, so it's about sort of trying to find that surgeon mentality back where you're a bit calmer and just sort of stroke the ball around, whereas yeah, I feel like it's been a bit bit challenging in the first half of the year. So are you a perfectionist? Uh, I actually don't like this word because I feel like people use it to compliment themselves a lot of the time, like in a weird yeah. way. It's like, oh, what's your biggest weakness? Oh, I'm such a perfectionist sort of thing. Um, I don't know, that might be a harsh judgment. It's just been well, my yeah. analysis of it. So I would say perfectionist is that you are such a, a tough Um, marker on yourself yeah yeah I don't I think I am but I don't see it as a positive thing like I want to be no that's right yeah that's why I asked the question yeah Yeah. I uh like I hate how I have to you know have this feeling but it's just like a yeah an obsession sort of thing where it's like yeah so I would say I am but yeah I just don't like when it's sort of used generically it's like I am it's like well you're not a perfectionist like even I can say this now because she's my fiance. Like she'll try and claim she's a perfectionist sometimes. And I'm like, no, you're not. Like <laughs> you're just not. Like trust me. And then, yeah, so it's one of those things where I think I am. But, yeah, I sort of want to be feeling good. It's like a feel thing. I just want to feel good and feel like, yeah, as I said, I've got this model of how I know my game works and I know I will succeed if I'm sort of mechanically moving and mentally in a certain place. And if I'm even 10% off that, uh, I find it quite frustrating and I even find it more frustrating if other people are telling me I'm going well when I feel like I'm not because mm. I know I'm not. But mm. you're sort of trying to find that, yeah, I guess perfect answer, which perfectionism or perfect doesn't exist. But I know if I am getting those sort of parts of my game right, I'm like, all right, I can feel confident that I'm going to do well. And if I don't do well, it's easier to accept, if that makes sense. Mm. Whereas like 
if you know something's not right and you're not doing well, it sort of doubles the frustration a little bit. Yep, absolutely. So when you, you, as you said, you're only 25. How would you describe your cricket career to this point? And we'll sort of mark it from the under-19 carnival where you sort of burst onto the scene and scored crazy runs and broke all sorts of records to where you're at now. So from that Vic under-19s team, you have played cricket for Australia, but yep. there's a lot that's gone on. Yeah that no one would normally experience in yeah. such a short period of time. Could you describe it? Uh, I think you said it pretty well the other day where it's like, I feel like I do everything opposite to a normal cricket person. Um, I would say unique in one word, just because, yeah, there's been a lot of times where, and I think when I got when I made a double hundred in Perth when I was 20, this was probably the most obvious thing to me where I would have received hundreds of messages from people along the lines of like, you must be so happy right now. And I was so miserable. And I'm like, that sort of sums it up in a way where it's like when I should have been feeling a certain way or been in a certain place, it sort of felt like the opposite. Like it's just been very zero or a hundred, but sort of in reverse a lot of the times. Um, yeah, it's weird to think you're only 25 because I'm sort of look at it and I'm like, you look at the test team and you're like, gee, I've got a fair bit of time in me here. Like this is quite positive. Um, but you sort of feel like a veteran at the same time because you've been around for a while. But yeah, I will just say unique. Like every time you think something's going well, it sort of then seems to fall off. And then when things are going really badly and you think, oh, you know, everyone thinks I've retired or I'm, I'm gone, you sort of find a way to come back. Um, yeah, which has been quite rare. But yeah, it's one of those things where, as I said, you've just got to sort of embrace it. Um, and like I've, yeah, I love playing for Victoria more than anything. And it's so good to be able to actually sort of experience that to its full capacity at the moment. And hopefully that just continues for as long as it possibly can, because yeah, it's just been so good. It's been sort of one of those things where, yeah, you're probably not getting the runs you'd like now and want to contribute a bit more in that regard to, to help some team wins. But um, yeah, I think whilst I'm happy playing, like I feel like that will come back naturally. And yeah, as you said, it's been some quite challenging batting conditions as well, which has made it sort of extra hard at the top of the order. But yeah, it's one of those things where, yeah, I don't know, I've probably rambled on a bit, but it's uh, unique, probably sums it up because yeah. it just sort of feels bizarre that every time, yeah, something yeah happens, it, it sort of feels like it's at the opposite end of the spectrum in a way. I, I want to get to the sort of the moving forward shortly, but Dealing with the pressure. So, as you said, you know, 20 years of age, you score a double hundred. No one does that. And you've scored three double hundreds for Victoria uh, by, what, 22, 23? No, again, no one really does that sort of thing unless you're Don Bradman. But that with that comes pressure because everyone wants you to do well. Yeah. Victorian cricket fans desperately want you to do well. Australian cricket fans want you to do well. That's a massive pressure. Is that is that hard? Uh, to be honest, Whitey, that compared to what I've been through outside that is like sipping on a pina colada in Ibiza. Like I just have never really felt that kind of pressure because I think to a degree I've never, um, in a weird way, never had that much, like I've never thought I was very talented. Like I have always sort of thought it's more, you just sort of, do your mental thing and like you'll outlast opponents or you'll out concentrate them or if you just yeah. sort of um, stick to your process, that kind of works. Um, yeah, I've never felt super – the only time I've ever felt talented was when I got my first double hundred where I was in like – it was this like out of this world state where I was so mentally just gone that it like was just so computerised that – I was like, this is actually pretty easy. And I'm playing like a first class game at the Wacker. I'm 20 years old. I'm just like, all I'm doing is looking to play a straight drive every ball. And if it's not there, I'll pull it. If it's a bit shorter, if it's outside off, I'll cut it. And if it's full, I'll straight drive it. And like, it was like, oh, that was genuine autopilot where I'm like, if I can ever get back there again, <laughs> cricket's the easiest sport <laughs> in the world. But other than that, I've never found it easy. I've never felt like I was super talented. Um, so the crazy thing about that day is you were 60 or not out overnight yeah, and you are almost not well enough to go out and play that next day to yeah. go from 60 to 200. That, yeah. That's where it's just 
yeah, it was bizarre. It was like an almost an out of body experience where you like. I remember walking off. I made two hundred and forty, faced three hundred and ten balls, and it felt like I'd had a five minute hit in the backyard. Like it was just, yeah. I wish I could find that somehow without the other side to it because yeah, I've sort of worked towards that in a way. Um, but yeah, it was just one of those days where sort of everything clicked and. Um, yeah, it's one of those things where I think, yeah, I've never had a heap of faith in my own ability, which I kind of wish I had. Like you listen mm. to some other athletes talk and you're like, they have so much faith in their own uh, Whether it's Which is often the secret to their success. Yeah, which is like whether it's fully real or not, I'm not – I find it hard to believe because I don't have that, but I wish I had that because I know when I do have that, I get the best out of myself, but it's so hard to get there in yeah. a way. Yeah. Um, especially having spent so much time out of the game, so hard to just walk in and be like, hey, just you see the ball and you just play what you see. Mm. Um, I feel like I can get there in the nets quite a bit, but I don't know whether it's sort of um, the excitement of being back and feeling like you sort of actually have a future in the game, which mm. has been probably the hardest thing, but um, as in whether that's sort of hampering me a little bit, but... Yeah, it's that sort of freedom to just go, okay, I want to go out there and just see ball, sort of hit ball. Um, you sort of listen to like Ricky talk and stuff like that and you can tell they just had that where it was just like, hey, I don't care who you are. I'm just better than you sort of thing, which, yeah, as I said, I've never had, but hopefully I can build that back slowly over time. Be scary if you get that based on what you've done <laughs> under, the, under the circumstances. So the other part, I'm trying to ask questions that, that the cricket fan would want me to ask you with what you've gone through. So if it's too personal, you don't have to answer it. But the other part is because I felt, and a lot of people would think part of your mental health challenges have been that expectation that's yeah. placed on you. And the other part of it is the concussions yeah. and, and what impact that may have had on, you know, anxiety of being, you know, worried about getting hit again, all these sorts of things. Yeah. Can you, are you able to share a little bit about, about that and whether there is or there isn't a, a connection. It's almost like myth busting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't think the expectations had anything to do with it. To be honest, as I said, like compared to what I've been through, that has felt pretty easy, mm -hmm. um, and I've been able to block that out. Well, not that I've really felt like I had to, because yeah, as I said, the other stuff has always been so, um, I guess, mu so much more prominent in yeah. my life, um, overshadowing everything else. Yeah. So yeah. it's sort of that kind of thing. It was just like, oh. People can say whatever they want to say. The things I found frustrating were when there were a few, like especially around sort of Australian selection, like I remember a few articles coming out saying I was just like nervous and stuff and I was like, if only you knew. And I'm like, I found that that quite hard to deal with because I'm like, I'm actually fighting something that's really, really tough. Um, well, for me it was anyway. And like for people to just assume without any, you know, knowledge of the situation was uh pretty offensive um i'd like to think i'm not someone who gets offended easily but that mm -hmm. kind of hurt me quite a bit um especially when you're sort of going through it at the time and uh yeah so that was quite tough i think the concussion stuff's definitely linked uh i sort of link the i guess mental health stuff back to my first concussion like i'd never i guess identified it in a nasty way um, previous to that, which was, so I got that when I was 15 or 16 and I don't think repeated head knocks necessarily help, but as I said, I've met some pretty incredible people that have really helped with a lot of that stuff. And, um, I had a lot of concussion symptoms that over sort of a seven or eight year period actually never subsided. You just sort of got used to, I guess, having them in a way like the brain's pretty amazing and can like find ways to adapt and like I would I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble legally for saying this but I would fail concussion tests in the exact same way every single time regardless of whether I'd been hit in the head and that was over a seven or eight year period until I sort of met some people that um were maybe a bit more because it's obviously a pretty fast moving um space the concussion space mm. so I don't put any blame on doctors or anything like that because no one's really known. Like I remember when I got my first one, it was like sit at home and do nothing. Mm. And now it's like, no, get out and go for a walk pretty much the next day. So it's like things have changed pretty rapidly. Um, but yeah, I would, the, the, I guess technical concussion tests were like, yeah, I would sort of fail them in the exact same way regardless for an eight-year period. And then I had so many symptoms where like 
So I got a sinus operation because I couldn't breathe through my nose had this, and like struggled with sinusitis. So they're like, oh, we'll have this operation. It'll help. Made no difference. Met this, this guy um, probably about two or three years ago now who like ran a few tests on me. He was like, have you had sinus problems? And I'm like, yeah. And I had an operation and it didn't work. And he's like, yeah, it's actually because this part of your brain's been like affected from the concussions and um, sort of explained it to me started doing like the rehab that he'd prescribed and within like a month it had cleared up and you're like, right. what the hell? Like that's bizarre. And even the way I was failing these concussion tests, he sort of fixed within a month or two and you're like, Jesus, this is quite bizarre. And even little things like anytime I stood up, I'd just get dizzy. Like this is over sort of a six, seven year period, but you just sort of get used to it yep. and it just becomes, it becomes normal. normal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, like a lot of little things like that, which um, – I guess on top of like the mental health stuff, which again, I wish when I was 16, I had, you know, someone saying like, Hey, this stuff can, you know, make things worse that, um, you know, you had when you were a kid or whatever. And like, yeah, with what I've got, you sort of look back and you're like, Oh, I've had sort of tendencies to go down that path, but it was never nasty. And then that kept first concussion made it quite nasty and just got worse and worse over time. And like, yeah, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty. Like you wish you had different um, pathways and methods then. But yeah, I think the concussion stuff is definitely linked, but is also like a lot of talk about like retirement regarding concussions. And I think I think I heard Buck mention this about a month or two ago in the media, but he was definitely right that the concussions have sort of masked the bigger issues. And that's, yeah, the mental health stuff's been a much bigger issue for me than even the concussions. I've always been very like, I'll be okay. Like once the symptoms and stuff subside enough, you know, I don't really fear for my long-term health. It's more the, the mental health side, which has been the, the tougher part. So when there, there was a game here at Junction Oval against New South Wales, I think it was New South Wales, where yeah. you got hit and it was, um, I remember broadcasting at the time, and it was pretty scary to see how it all unfolded. Yeah. And so I'm interested in, in your mindset on that in that, you love to play the short ball. You yeah. always played it really well. Yeah. Um, there's famous stories about the Victorians uh, when you went into the nets that they they wanted to bowl as fast as they could to you because they wanted to test you out and they couldn't believe how well you you handled that. Yeah. Has that now changed or you still can play and feel you can play the short ball as well as, as ever? Yeah, I feel like I can. It's probably, again, it's that confidence thing of going like if I just back my skill I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I always play it at my best when I'm in that mindset, but I play every shot at my best when I'm in that mindset. So it's like probably about, you know, I guess continuing on that path to, to getting into that, uh, I guess, mental state again, which I feel like, I, as I said before, I'm sort of getting back towards. But, yeah, I think it's one of those things where if you get hit enough, it's sort of – you sort of don't like getting hit, yeah. obviously, but um, – yeah, to be honest, it's probably one of those things where if I had that, uh, you know, bit more self-belief, I'd probably just walk out there next innings and do it. But I know I can do it. And I think to a degree, I haven't done the stats on this because I don't really care enough to do so. <laughs> but if there's a statistician out there, but per ball's faced, I'd probably get hit in the head at, at the same rate as anyone else would. Yeah. But I think the concussion story of amplifies course. that yeah. sort of um, thing of like, oh, he can't play the short ball. And it's like, well probably average 80 against the short ball in my career. So it's like, I don't know what I average against it, but like I feel like I average it more against that than the full ball. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's one of those things where, yeah, you sort of laugh at it a little bit because you're like, well, you know, people are going to say what they want to say, but if it gets me a few runs because <laughs> they think I've got a weakness to it, then that's yeah. a bonus. So is it um, part of your progression that you can now look back and separate the concussion challenges versus the mental health challenges, as much as obviously the mental health challenges are still challenges. Is that part of your progress that you're starting to sort of navigate your way through your life, not your cricket career, your life? Yeah, I think so. And I think to a degree, I was probably in denial about it for a while. Mm -hmm. And once I sort of accepted that all right, these mental health challenges are the real problem here, I need to grasp this and like, you know, try and find any avenue possible. Um, I think that's really helped because you're sort of like, okay, we can actually work towards something yeah. now because you're yep. sort of – obviously the lines do get blurred a bit. But, um, 
yeah, I sort of try and see concussion as just like an injury, which has happened in the past. And it's like, you know what, if you get hit, just deal with it again, you'll be okay. Um, but yeah, the, the mental health side, probably accepting that that's my much bigger challenge. And if I want to get to where I want to get to, that's what I'm going to have to find a way through. Um, then yeah, that has definitely sort of simplified things for me a bit. Cause it's like, okay, con- concussion stuff's one thing, you know, I feel like I've ticked off a lot of stuff in that space, but yeah, the, the mental side's a bit, that's going to be a bit more challenging. How close were you to giving it away? Uh, yeah, bloody close. Very, very close. Um, yeah, I'd, it, it had gotten to the stage where I'd had discussions with people saying like, yeah, I think this is it. Um, you know, I was sort of comfortable that I'd given it everything. And then funnily enough, someone who I've worked with very closely for a very long period of time um, said to me, so I'd sort of had a week to think about it and I hadn't changed my mind. I'm like, oh, I've tried everything. And to a degree, being happier in everyday life made me want to give it away more because I'm like, I've got too much to lose now. Um, and then, yeah, I spoke to this person who's worked with me and they just go like, well, like I've never seen someone, you know, try as hard as you have to try and get on top of this, you know, bugger this, just retire. Like you've tried so hard, you've given it everything. And they said that to me and I was like, oh, no, I'll go one more. I've got one more crack in me. And then, yeah, sort of had some discussions with Sykes and stuff and, sort of, yeah, they gave me sort of these other sort of solutions and stuff, which, yeah, have really done the job. So it's just been probably one of those things where you're like, Joe, I was pretty close, but I'm glad I didn't. Is that recently? Pretty recent, yeah. More recent than you'd think. So because I was thinking your season over in England this year, yeah. which you played for Weybridge, um, yeah. good cricket, but more for you, yeah. it's cricket that you can cope with pretty easily. Yeah that, oh, if you were able to play a whole season of England, this is this is really encouraging yeah. signs. But was that part of where you're at now or is it totally different? Totally yeah, no, nah, it is, yeah. And I loved it in England and I'm going to go back next year. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this yet, but I've signed with Leicester for the first five games of the county season, which would be good. Nice. So I'm really excited about that. And then um, hoping to go back to Weybridge. So I'm going to come home for three or four weeks after that and then go back and play for Weybridge again. Um so, yeah, I'm just in a sort of bliss period now where I'm just loving it and just want to get as much under my belt as possible and, um, yeah, get back to that stage hopefully where batting starts really clicking for me as well and then, um, yeah, can, can, tr- can contribute to some more some more wins. But, yeah, it's been one of those things where, yeah, it's been a hell of a journey but, yeah, it's sort of gotten to a stage now where I'm like, okay, I've found what I needed to find and yeah, things are really starting to click. But yeah, it's all even coming back and playing club cricket last year was about sort of, um, I guess, a more specific treatment plan and England was part of that as well. And like this season's been part of that. So yeah, it's been one of those things where uh, we've probably in the past tried to rush back because Mm. I've just had a desire to go and play and then you face the same issues. But yeah, going that more... Um, elongated approach has has really benefited me, which has been great. So it sounds like you haven't fallen back in love with cricket. That's always been there. Yeah. It's it's unlocking. Yeah. It's, almost like finding out how to fix the Rubik's Cube. Yeah, it as, is. Is the thing that you've needed to do. Cricket's not been the problem. No, nah, it's never been cricket. It's I've always loved cricket. I've always wanted to be a professional cricketer. It's As you said, it's pretty much – and I – it's hard because I know this would be hard for people to understand, um, especially without sort of giving away all the details. But, yeah, I guess it's it's a really hard thing to comprehend because it doesn't really make sense. Like I've, as I said, I've explained to my fiance countless times what I go through and she still can't really, like she's amazing with it, but also it doesn't make sense to her. And I wouldn't really expect anyone who hasn't been through it for it to make sense to them either. But, yeah, it's one of those things where you've just had to sort of, you know, search every corner of the earth for Mm. any solution you can find. And like, I guess my love of cricket is what's kept me in cricket and trying for as long as I have. Like if I didn't love the game and have such a strong desire to, you know, play the game at the highest level, I probably would have given up five, six years ago, Mm. but that's kept me in it. And I've been very, very lucky that Korea Victoria in particular have been really supportive and able to, I guess, stick by me throughout some annoying times. And like, I've 
the thing that I've hated probably the most is like feeling like you're letting Cricket Victoria down, your teammates down. Um, yeah, which has probably been equally as hard to deal with as the whole actual disorder I've been through. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things where I'm hoping that all their faith in me and my teammates faith in me, hopefully I can repay that now over the next sort of, well, ideally 10 years and like really give back to Victorian cricket where I feel like, you know, if I was in another place, maybe they would have just said, no, nah, you're too difficult for us. Either try your luck somewhere else or it's not for you sort of thing. So yeah, that's where I'm sort of at now with it all. What's that like? Because you've got your teammates. Um, you've also got players that would like to have your spot in the team. Yeah. Um, you've got, Different coaches, you talked about Lockie Stevens, Andrew McDonald was here when you first were sort of coming through and then you've now got Chris Rogers who's got all that wealth of experience as an opening batsman for yeah. his country um, that you've got there as a resource. What's what's all that been like? You've sort of touched on it before, but what's what's that specifically like? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's certainly different. Like it presents its challenges. Obviously the teammates thing is probably the thing I find the hardest because like they're the ones you're – out there with and um the ones you hate letting down the most uh with the coaches I was very lucky that I had Lockie and Ron and sort of Mickey Lewis I'm trying to think if there's anyone else at the start that was pretty much when I first started my career um just to have them around too like I've still all got a really good relationship with them um but yeah to be honest for my game development as well and understanding how I bat and my mechanics and stuff like they were amazing for me which has been great and then obviously sort of as I probably understood my game a bit better um Buck came in and uh, I've had Betty Rora in recent times as well um but yeah it's one of those things where from the coach's perspective like it's so hard because you try and like I guess explain to them what you go through but like again it's such a bizarre sort of thing where it's like it's really hard to understand and I understand how hard it is to understand and mm -hmm. like I'm sure people probably think like oh yeah the pressure or he just doesn't want to play and stuff but that has just never been it in the slightest and that's the hardest part to get across because it sort of looks like that like if you're taking consistent breaks from the game it's like well he clearly doesn't like it that much but that's just never been the case whatsoever but um they've been amazing like I think at the start it was quite hard for them to wrap their heads around it but yeah uh, they've been incredible and tried their absolute best to understand it and support me as best they can. And that's all you can really ask. And yeah, as I said, I just want to repay the faith that all those people have shown in me because yeah, I can understand it would have been so much easier to just go, no, nah, mate, it's just, it's too difficult. Like, you know, we need to pick someone who can play every game and like, you're just pissing too many people around, but yeah, I'm um, yeah, so grateful that they've sort of stuck by me. And then, yeah, as I said, hopefully the next sort of five to ten years I can repay that. The, the last one on what you're going through mentally, when you have shared that with the people closest with you and your um, the psychologists and, and so forth, is it scary for them to hear what you're saying, as in uh, like uh, overwhelming, or is it more like a a Goodwill hunting movie or a beautiful <laughs> mind movie where there's all these numbers and letters and, and none of it sort of makes sense. It, it, I'm just trying to work out what, how, how people really close to you yeah. are feeling when they're seeing what you're going through, if that yeah. makes sense. Psych's definitely not scared because they see it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been very lucky that I've found sort of a team of psychs that really get my sort of thing and um, specialise in what I need. I think family and friends pretty like – rattled by it at the start because it's like yeah as I said it's pretty ridiculous and you sort of when you explain it in its full detail it's like Jesus like yeah right like yeah so they were a bit rattled I think telling so my mum's got a psych degree so I think she was a bit more okay than dad but when I told dad and gave him like the full extent of it um the look on his face scared me more than anything because he doesn't really show I guess a heap of worry like even at you know he's one of those people who are I'm convinced he's never had a negative thought in his life like it's just everything's just you know happy go lucky and you know roll around doing whatever you want and when I sort of explain it to him and he's played cricket before and um yeah I sort of explain it to him in the cricket context and then sort of the whole life context and yeah I remember him just being like almost mortified just like the look on his face was quite I guess revealing to me um 
And then, yeah, you sort of, I haven't even gone into too much detail with many of my friends, to be honest. Um, probably Sammy Harper is the one that I've gone into the most detail with. and Who's also had his own challenges. Who's also had his yeah. own challenges. But yeah, so we've always just had that almost too close relationship where we just tell each other everything. And um, yeah, he's been amazing for me, especially around sort of the cricket context, but also the the general life context. Like he's one of my best, best friends in the world. So I'm pretty lucky in that regard. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things where even my close friends, I haven't gone, like I've sort of given them brief snippets. Is that to protect them a little bit or is it yeah, protecting you maybe? I, I think or? it's a bit of a bloke thing where it's just sort yeah. of like when I'm with them, like, I'm fine and they probably don't feel that comfortable asking. And like, it's one of those things, how do you bring it up? Like, and I don't, yeah, I don't really feel the need to as well. Like you sort of, yeah, as I said, I've got my psychs, I've got my parents, I've got my partner or fiance, she'll crack it at me if I don't tell her. (laughs) Um, I've got Sammy, like I've got enough people that I can have those chats with. Like I don't need everyone involved. Like they, you know, I guess respect my boundaries in that regard. And like, I know they're always Mm -hmm. there for me if I need, but I'm sort of, a bit you know it's all good like don't worry like it's not what it seems and stuff like that um and yeah so in that regard it's yeah a bit different but yeah it's one of those things where ideally I probably wouldn't have had to tell as many people as Mm. I did but obviously the sport you're in like if you were just going through this and living a normal job you'd probably get away with it a bit more like it's a very public yeah like if I was a commentator permanently it would be probably a bit easier because you sort of deal with it in private but because, yeah, you're a professional sportsman. Yeah. Everyone sort of has to know and everyone has their opinions. And, yeah, even some of the stories you hear about, like, why I've had mental health breaks. Like, yeah, I've had people come up to me or being like, oh, this random guy came, without knowing that I was friends with this person, being like, yeah, he's in rehab for, like, a drug addiction. I'm like, well, that's just blatantly not true at all. Like, just ridiculous things like that where you're like, gee, people are good at sort of making stuff up and creating their own stories with stuff they've really got no mm-hmm. idea about. I think even you just doing this today is going to make a lot, make sense to a lot more people. Yeah, right? hopefully. And yeah. this is brave in itself, doing what you're doing today. <laughs> Playing for Australia, you've played the one test match and I still remember you with the baggy green hat on, just this beaming smile on your face. What what do you remember of that match against India at the SCG? Uh, I remember getting dropped twice, which I was very <laughs> happy about. Um, I think like – I don't think I've ever felt like – a. Um, I guess, excitement like that in my life, like especially when we won the toss and we were batting and I was like, wow, this is really happening. Um, And then, yeah, singing the anthem and you're like, all right, Boomer is at the top of his mark in four minutes and I'm frigging facing it. Like, here we go. Uh, And even at, I think I was 22 at the time, I felt like there'd still been such a big build up towards it because I'd sort of been um, in and out of squads before that and, you know, just not made it for a variety of reasons. And then to actually be there and be like, all right, this is it. Uh, it was pretty exciting. And yeah, it was one of those days where even like, they're all obviously very high class bowlers, but you were just on like such an adrenaline rush that it, it didn't feel slow, but it felt like you were just so hyper aware. And like, I remember being relieved because it started raining in about the seventh over. Yeah, that's right. And I was like, I needed that just to go and calm down for a bit. <laughs> like I was on about, I don't know, 12 or something at the time. And I'm like, I'm on too much of an adrenaline rush here. Like I need, and we had like, I don't know, it might've been an hour or two rain delay. I can't remember how much it was, but yeah, I just remember being relieved that we got to come off for a bit. So I could actually like compose myself because that first sort of six or seven overs, you just felt like you were on such a high. And then, yeah, obviously did my shoulder at the end of that, which uh, complicated things (laughs) a little bit. But, yeah, it's one of those things where I don't think you can replicate that feeling in anywhere else in life, to be honest, as a cricketer. Like it was just, yeah, incredible. So with everything that's going on in your world and in your mind, how much or how often do you – think back to that and think, I want that again. Does uh, that, does that, because so many people play cricket, they dream of playing for Australia. You've yeah. done it. You've had that very small sample size, that taste of it. Yeah. Do you still have that aspiration? Do you still have those dreams? Yeah, I think, to be honest, in recent times, more so than ever, because probably for the first time in my life, I sort of truly believe that I could do it and do it over an extended period. I think whilst I've had this other cloud sort of lingering over my head, it was very much like, yeah, I know I want it and I know I aspire to do it, but 
whilst this sort of demon's sitting there, I know it's going to be, you know, hard, if not impossible. Whereas now I see the possibility of it, which is the most exciting thing of all, where you go, okay, that's a genuine aspiration where I don't think those, well, I sort of know now those roadblocks aren't going to be in the way. Um, yeah, which has been huge for me, to be honest. Um, but again, you probably end up going back to that normal cricketers thing of going like, I want to do well too badly. Um, yeah. Which funnily enough, yeah, when you flip that and just go, nah, bugger it, I don't care anymore, is probably when you bat your best and, and get back into that sort of flow state. So um, yeah, it's one of those things where, yeah, I think that ambition is burning probably harder than it ever has purely because I actually feel like now I've got faith that I could really do it. It's awesome to hear you say that because we, you know, talk back radio, um, social media, um, they all want to know, you know, will do you want, not so much uh, will you do it again, it's yeah. more do you want to do it yeah. again or can you, have you the capability to yeah. do it Yeah, I think again? that's probably the better question. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's probably more do you have the capability to do it again and, yeah, I feel like now I genuinely do, which I've, to be honest, never felt in my life until the last or any since I was 15 or 16 anyway. Um, yeah, up until now I've never truly felt that I had that capability, whereas now I do, which is pretty amazing. It's very exciting. Um, because we see Mike, Mike Hussey seems to be the – um, the template for people, oh, you're 30, 31 before yeah. you played and then played 70 tests and yeah. happy days. You're only or nearly 26. Um, but with all you've gone through, there's also that whole thing of going through life experiences actually helps you become a better cricketer because so much of cricket's about decision-making and yeah. making the right decisions and knowing knowing yourself. Yeah, um, You're going through a lot now, but that might actually hold you in good stead. I might be putting this, saying this through rose-colored glasses, <laughs> but it might actually put you in good stead for for an extended run. Yeah, I think so for sure. And even um, it's good that I'm probably going through a phase now where you're almost relearning batting again. Because mm. yeah, as I said, like you probably don't realize how much um, it takes. Like I've missed so much cricket over sort of a two or three year period, um, and I probably didn't have a full appreciation for how hard it is to just like get back into the rhythm of things, but. Yeah, I actually quite enjoy the fact that I'm going through a bit of a phase at the moment where runs-wise things aren't going how I'd like them to. But you're sort of like, okay, once I've come through this and I'm on the other side, like imagine how much faith I'm going to have in myself that like, okay, mm. I know what to do in that regard. Because it was probably something, yeah, that I hadn't experienced since I was sort of 16 or 17 purely because I hadn't played enough continuous cricket to really go through any of those phases. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's all sort of hopefully heading in the right direction. And the reality check is dealing with failure is part of becoming a better cricketer yeah, as exactly. well. And it's, yeah. it's it. I'm not sort of teasing you by saying that, but it's almost um, you're normal to not be making runs because usually when you go out there, you just everyone just expects you to, and probably you have expected yeah. to make runs. Yeah, I think you sort of yeah probably get into that a bit where mm. you're like, all right, well. You know, I haven't missed out more than maybe three or four times in a row for a while. And then you go through a patch where you miss out seven or eight times in a row or, you know, 11 times out of 12 and you're sort of like in a bit of panic <laughs> panic mode. But then, yeah, go back and simplify things again. Um, and, yeah, it's one of those things where once you're on the other side, yeah, you sort of feel like the whole world's against you for a bit. But then, yeah, it sort of flips pretty quickly. And I sort of, yeah, I follow other sports quite intently as well and you sort of notice – little different things that different mm. people go through and then they work through it. And yeah, I read a lot of stuff, not as much about cricket funnily enough, but like I read a lot of soccer stuff. Like I'm just, I think soccer's my release in a way where like I get like a huge fix yep. from there and yeah, follow that quite closely. And they're under like pressure times a million because um, obviously the money they're on is ridiculous. But on top of that, like it's a worldwide genuine like, yeah. You know, they get – if you Googled your name as a soccer player <laughs> on Twitter or something after a game, you're probably not going to get that much positive no, feedback. No, I don't think so. But, um, yeah, it's I find it really interesting reading about how they sort of go through phases like that stuff as well. So, yeah. Um, a couple more. You talked before about Victoria, um, and I talked, I've talked a lot about your age, but it is a very young squad. Take out a couple of senior pros, if you like. Yeah. How exciting is that for you as you start to look forward now thinking of that age demographic and what 
the potential is for you to be part of something, I think, pretty special here at Victoria over an extended period. Yeah, it is pretty exciting. It's changed so much from when I first started. Yeah. I felt like, you know, it was basically all senior pros. It was almost like that team got to its um, got to its peak uh, sort of at the start of my career and was really, like, obviously winning heaps and winning everything. And, yeah, I feel like we're in that stage now where that new generation's come through and... To be honest, I think given how young we've been, we've probably overperformed in the last few years. Like you would think you would go through a bit of that regeneration, but we made the last two Shield finals, is that right? Which is a pretty good effort with such a young squad. Um, And obviously got Subbo as a young captain, which is really exciting because it's sort of bringing that group together and going, hey, you're you're the leaders now. Like you're you're in Mm. charge. It's Um, your team. Yeah, which is... Yeah, really exciting. And, um, yeah, I think we've got obviously all the young guys that have, especially in the bowling attack, that have been outstanding. And then, yeah, I think we've got heaps of people waiting in the wings as well, which is really good. So it's like you've got that that depth. And um, we've got Maddo, who's more a senior pro, but he's been injured for a while, but he'll come back after Christmas, which is super exciting. And, um, yeah, it's we've probably got that good balance at the moment with those still got enough senior players to sort of steer the ship. And they've been around the block a few times, but... Yeah, I'm particularly excited. That young bowling attack, like in three or four years' time when sort of Subbo, Pez, Ferg, uh, we've got big Cammy McClure, mm. Sammy Elliott's played a bit of white ball cricket. I hope I haven't left anyone No, out, they're, the, they're the ones that I immediately thought yeah, of. Yeah, and like that that sort of really young core. And then obviously Toddy has yeah. done really, really well in a very sort of short career to date. But um, yeah, that young core, it's pretty exciting for sure. Where, where do you want to bat? I've always... Oh. I've always been, because again, a lot of people ask, what's Will Bukowski's best batting position? And, and obviously the default position is, well, you open the batting for Australia. But I see probably as a number four or three or probably four as someone that's just your best player bats, bats at three or four. Where do you see yourself? Well, this has been a best? particularly funny question because obviously I haven't been in, you know, test talk because it was obviously the whole opener thing in recent times but like a few people have sort of asked me about it in general about like the specialist opener thing and I just find it hilarious because I was like I wasn't an opener no. until I was and then I made 200 opening and then I was a specialist opener and you're like well am I a specialist opener or am I yeah so I think it's a bit of a furphy to be honest like I've never really understood that whole uh concept because yeah as you said like I'm, I'm an opener but I'm not you're top order batsman. yeah like it's just yeah it's a bit of yeah I don't know I, I always enjoyed probably batting three or four the most but I've never been that fast like I'm very just like you know what it's a ball just go out mm. see it and bat whatever's sort of best for the balance of the team because the only reason I opened in the first place was for team balance and like it wasn't you know it wasn't me going like oh I think there's an opening spot in the test team like can I open it was literally Two days before the first Shield game a few years ago, Buck was like, oh, would you mind opening, looking at the team balance? We think it's best if you open. I said, yeah, no worries. You and then 480 with Marcus. Yeah, and then like <laughs> you do well and then you're a specialist opener yeah. two days later. So I think, yeah, sport's quite funny in that regard where it's like, yeah, oh, such and such is a specialist opener. But I've also been of the belief if you can open, you can bat anywhere yeah. um, because opening is probably the hardest spot. So it's like especially in Shield cricket at the moment, like, opening or sort of batting three is, you know, probably got one with your name on it in the first 15 overs and you'd want to be a good player and misser. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, probably, yeah, three or four if I got to pick, but, yeah, I'm not, it's a 51-49 type thing. Like, it's not, not yeah. a big deal to me. Because the old-fashioned way of looking at it, I think, has always been your best player, you try and protect him, that if he comes in in the 25th over, He's more likely to succeed. Yeah. He's less likely to have one with his name written on it. Yeah. It's up for the other guys to protect the best player. Yeah. But Steve Smith's almost defied convention and said, no, 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 I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is interesting, but I guess it's probably easier to go up top when you've made about 9,000 yeah, runs at 60 point. in your career before you go, oh, I've got there with a bit of confidence and a bit, a few yeah. runs on the board. Um, but yeah, and I think, to be honest, maybe he needs that. Just for him, like yeah. just to go, all right, you know what? Like I've played for a bloody long time and he's probably, obviously Davey and the bowlers have done it as well, but like it's probably the first time where the schedule has been genuinely packed for a 
like for him, he would have just played nonstop cricket mm. for the last 12 years um, at the highest level, obviously. So maybe just to get a bit of that regeneration, it might just help him mentally to go, okay, I've got a, a new challenge in a way rather than, mm. um, yeah, because it almost, it almost seems harder for him at four because he's so good. They're so defensive towards him that it's yes. hard to score in a way. Yep. Um, and I always, this might sound bizarre, but I think opening the batting is actually easier in international cricket than it is at shield level because the shield wickets do a lot more and shield bowlers are still very, very good. You're not, obviously, yeah, the standard increases as you go up, but um, yeah, I think the way international cricket's set up where the wickets are a bit flatter, I don't think he'll have much trouble with it, to be honest. I just think of Marcus Harris when you say that. And I get yeah. a bit sad. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, that's a that's whole a other discussion podcast. for another yeah. day. Exactly right. Um, that's that's pretty much it. The the last thing I had I had to ask you is, do you feel relief, confidence in yourself that you can sit down like this today and have a chat and give an insight to everybody about how you've been feeling and and what you want to be doing forward? Is that does that feel good? Does it feel like you're making even more progress? Yeah, it definitely does. And yeah, I. I want to help people as well because um, – and I I kind of wish I had more courage to sort of like, I guess, go through these things on the fly. But I think whilst I'm still playing, I find that really hard to sort of do publicly, um, which yeah, I wish I sort of, as I said, had a bit more courage to go, all right, I'm going to be really open about this stuff and really help people. But, yeah, hopefully I can do that as my career progresses. But – probably don't feel quite ready to do it just yet. But yeah, when Dill messaged me, I was actually really excited about it because it was like, okay, I feel like the time it actually feels good because for the first time I'm probably feel like I'm not masking too much, which is mm. really nice. Like you've sort of, I guess I've always felt like I've had to be quite delicate with things. And um, yeah, I feel like I'm sort of opening up more and more and yeah, it's always nice to talk when things are going well as well. It sort of helps yeah, a yeah, lot because absolutely. yeah, you sort of get that that nice feeling being able to go, okay, things are going that way rather than, you know, it's been a, you know, hell to skelter week or whatever. But yeah, so it's, it is really good. And thanks for having me because it's been, yeah, perfect timing. Yeah, You've absolutely. Done this beautifully. Absolutely. And is there, have you got a message? If there might be people that have listened specifically to this podcast feeling that they feel similar to you. Yeah. Um, or some level of anxiety or some level of perfectionism that we were talking about before. Yeah. Um, have you got a message for them? Yeah. Well, I think the main one is to not give up because like there's been times where I've felt like giving up in a variety of different ways and been really close to giving up. Um, and you think there's going to be no solution. There's going to be no cure. Um, which to be honest, there probably isn't a cure necessarily, but like things do get better and there's always tomorrow. Um, so I think don't give up is my biggest one because even like I've gone through countless psychs as well and like no disrespect to any of the psychs I've worked with, it probably just wasn't the right balance for me. And I, I know I've been very lucky because through cricket we get access to a lot of different people. But um, I think constantly searching for solutions, like at least you're doing the right thing. Like you're, you know, that's the one thing that you can probably control in amongst all of this is a lot of stuff you can't, but um, yeah, if you can sort of find the right people, like it might, might take a year, it might take a week, it might take five years, but keep, I guess, looking for those solutions. Um, I found like when I spoke to my family about it and my fiance and um, my, even my close friends that I felt like would be really helpful in those, those areas. Um, yeah, I found that really relieving. That might not be for everyone, but yeah, just don't give up and keep keep sort of searching for the right people because once you get them and they're in your corner, it just lifts a big weight off your shoulders. Well, firstly, congratulations on getting engaged. It is fantastic to talk to you. It's fantastic to know that in a couple of weeks you'll be back wearing uh, the Victorian colours again, um, playing Sheffield Shield Cricket here at uh, the City Power Centre. Um and I think I speak on behalf of all cricket fans. It's just great to see you happy. And I think that's Thanks, the most important it. thing. That's more important than any cricket uh, to be played. And who knows what happens into the future. Yeah. But it sounds like it's, it's, it's blue sky head. Yeah. Thanks, Wiley. Thanks for having me. Will Pekoski joining us on the Vic State Cricket Podcast. Uh, a fascinating chat. And, um, yeah, I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's really special to have uh, Will come in and talk because I think there's so many people that can get something out of what he's just been prepared to share today. We'll catch you again next time.